How to think about the spread of nuclear weapons, next on The Line. This is On The Line, and I'm Eric Felton. Once upon a time, heading off nuclear war was all about managing the Cold War standoff between the Soviet Union and the United States. But now, long after the Cold War is over, there's a new nuclear reality. There are many more nuclear-armed nations, a proliferation that Paul Bracken calls in a new book, The Second Nuclear Age. How does this second nuclear age differ from the first? Is it more or less dangerous? and are new strategies needed to head off the future use of nuclear weapons? I'll ask my guest. Paul Bracken, professor at Yale University and author of the book, The Second Nuclear Age, Strategy, Danger, and the New Power Politics. Welcome, thanks for joining us. Good to be here. Uh, well, Professor Bracken, let's talk a little bit about the first nuclear age. How, how do you describe the, the realities of the first nuclear age? Well, the first nuclear age begins uh, in 1945 with Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the early Cold War, but it has a clear ending, 1991. But I think if we step back and look at the whole expanse of those 45 years or so, we can see certain patterns, what I call lessons of the first nuclear age, the, uh, the Cold War. And let me just give a couple of them to get the discussion going. The first one is you don't have to fire a nuclear weapon to use it. And that is nuclear weapons were used every single day. We shouldn't think about, quote, using, unquote, nuclear weapons as firing them at the enemy cities. The uh, United States, for example, used nuclear weapons to get away with defense on the cheap. We never spent more than 10% of our GNP on defense, whereas the Soviets were forced to spend 25%. Another lesson, a larger lesson, is what I call nuclear head games, that the leaders of both countries Used, created these illusory threats of what might happen if the other side did something. And they often didn't even tell their own militaries about this. And what I find interesting in the United States is how these nuclear head games were played by every single president from Truman to the end of the Cold War Bush. Didn't matter whether they were conservative, liberal, Republican, Democrat, they all played them. And yet you said that in the first nuclear age, quote, both superpowers were extremely conservative when it came to nuclear yes. weapons. What, what do you mean by that? Yeah, that's right. When it, came, when it came to nuclear war, both sides had these very conservative bureaucracies. They always relied on status quo policies, honoring tradition, not taking too many risks. There were a couple of exceptions to this, like in the Cuban Missile Crisis. But when we, when we look back, we see that these were exceptions to the rule. And after about the mid-1960s, the United States dramatically lowered its reliance on nuclear weapons and started to build up its conventional forces. And this is quite different from where the world we're going into now. Because even back in the Cold War, whatever the crisis over Taiwan, Berlin, or Cuba, if it was going to escalate to a nuclear war, it had to go through Moscow and Washington and they really didn't want that to happen. In fact, recent revelations of the Cuban crisis have come out, and we can see Castro asking the Soviets for nuclear weapons to use against the United States. But there was no way on God's green earth Moscow was ever going to let Castro or any other of their clients have nuclear weapons because it was just too dangerous. And is there a sense that if, uh, if Castro had had nuclear weapons that he might have used them and, and in a way that a, that a small country now might, might use them if they had them? Well, I think that's exactly right. You see in these recently released transcripts of the Cuban crisis uh, that Castro is extremely upset. He's almost hysterical about the humiliation of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which he viewed the United States winning. And he wanted to retaliate against the United States even though he knew that it would destroy Cuba. Now, Moscow didn't want to have any part of this, but this is not just ancient history because today the situation is the mirror image. Today, Castro has the bomb. In other words, it's the local powers, whether it be Israel, Pakistan, North Korea, and certainly Iran might get the bomb, 
they actually control the, tr the nuclear triggers today, and that never happened in the Cold War. They were always held by the superpowers. When you say that, uh, that one big difference with these newer powers having nuclear weapons is that whereas the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War had a, a, a system that emphasized a sort of dispassionate uh, rational calculation about um, the use of nuclear weapons, that there may be a lot more uh, hatred and, uh, and, and passions of nationalism that come into play uh, in, the, in the second age. That's right. The first nuclear age, the, the greatest satire of the whole era was the movie Dr. Strangelove. And if you look at Dr. Strangelove, the movie, it, even today, if you take a look at it, it shows this hyper-rationality. There's, there's very little emotion in it. And this has its own pathologies, of course. But that's not the world we're going into. In the, in the big crises of the Cold War, you didn't have a million people jamming the mall in Washington or Red Square demanding the blood of the other people. Leaders of both sides knew that that was too dangerous. But we've already seen the tremendous nationalism in various crises uh, in China, in, in Red Square in China, where after uh, we bombed one of their embassies accidentally in the Yugoslav campaign. Uh, in Tehran, it happens all the time, in Lebanon. So if the ideology of the Cold War was liberal freedom versus communism, that doesn't, that's not the contest of the second nuclear age. Today it's about nationalism. And it's much more dangerous for that reason because it leads to hysteria, emotions, and decision makers are much closer to the street than in the Cold War. You also talk about how, though, after the Cold War is over, a, a lot fewer nuclear weapons these days, but a lot more rivalries causing tension around nuclear weapons. That's right. The, the peak numbers of nuclear weapons for the U.S. and Russia are down by about two-thirds. Um, there's so many that it, you don't, it doesn't, I don't know the exact numbers. No, people don't even know what they are. There's still plenty of them around. But there's been huge cuts. But what is more interesting is the number of nuclear decision-making centers. Uh, how many countries hold the trigger? Well, there's nine of them today. Iran is seemingly trying to be the tenth. But I would point out something else. You have terrorism, which although they don't have nuclear weapons, the terrorists, they can take actions which could precipitate a nuclear war if they struck at the height of a crisis. Ask yourself, what would happen if a terrorist group flew airplanes into the Empire State Building or the Pentagon at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis? That's not a nuclear weapon. But if, you, if what happened between India and Pakistan four years ago where uh, 10 people with rifles just terrorized the city of Mumbai, uh, we've seen other attacks on the parliament in India and many terrorism attacks in the Middle East. If they were timed to coincide with, say, a nuclear crisis between Iran and Israel, it really could be pushed over the brink. And how serious is the threat, uh, not only of terrorists being able to precipitate a nuclear conflict, but perhaps getting their hands on a nuclear weapon of some sort? Uh, is, is there a real threat of the proliferation of weapons going beyond um, dangerous states to uh, terrorist players? Well, clearly so. We see that with nuclear weapons and with chemical weapons, too, that the one of the reasons for not say provoking or trying to undermine the North Korean government today is that some North Korea may give some of these weapons to a terrorist group. That would certainly be possible with Iran and is a major concern with Syria right now. Well this is On the Line and I'm Eric Felton. We're talking with Yale University professor Paul Bracken about his book The Second Nuclear Age, Strategy, Danger and the New Power Politics. Uh, Professor Bracken, one of the things that's, that's fascinating in your book is you give a behind the scenes um, uh, sort of blow by blow about a lot of the, um, uh, the games that, that are played by uh, military and, and, uh, and civilian leaders to see what could happen in one situation or another. And you talk about how these games in the Cold War were, were largely two-player games, sort of like a game of chess where you have one player on either side of the board. But, but now we're looking at 
at games with many more players involved and how much more complicated that becomes. That's right. I mean, let me just give you uh, uh, an example. I, one of the reasons I was attracted to gaming as a source of insights is, is not because it's predicting things, but because it's discovering issues that nobody had really thought about before. And, and that's the real power of gaming. There's a tendency in academia sometimes to start out with cosmic abstractions and then deduce conclusions. But let me just give a concrete example. Uh, if there were an India-Pakistan crisis, well, China is building a set of reconnaissance satellites and signals intelligence of a kind the United States has, and they will be able to tell if India is going on nuclear alert. A lot of countries, if you look at the Cold War, when they go on nuclear alert, they want to do it in a way which doesn't draw attention to that fact for domestic political reasons. Also, they don't want to tip off the enemy. Well, the United States may be able to tell if India is going on a nuclear alert, but but China can too, and I've actually seen games where China passes this information along to, pa to Pakistan, and this dramatically changes the dynamics. It, it increases concerns in Islamabad that India is preparing for a strike on Pakistan, and this is very destabilizing. Well, people look at the history of, for example, World War I, and each country had its own set of war plans that were perhaps primarily defensive, but they involved having to mobilize quickly under time pressure. And it was only when all of those different plans came into play at the same time that it hurtled all of these nations into war, a war that they had not really sought out or anticipated. How, in the nuclear context, do you try to avoid various different players having their own plans for what to do in this situation or this situation that end up uh, hurtling forward as those situations trigger one another. It's interesting to go back to the Cold War and look at, at how that question was handled. And we got very lucky because the early uh, crises over access to Berlin, the Taiwan Straits crisis in 1958, these were pretty low level crises. And so the decision makers on both sides, in Moscow and Washington, saw the dynamics that were building up. And they learned from that. If we had had a serious crisis like the Cuban Missile Crisis in, say, the late 1940s, it could have been much worse because people learned on the job. And one of the things I have uh, a great deal of uh, apprehension about is that what the first crisis of the second nuclear age will be. Because the governments of India, Pakistan, and I would point out Israel, have never really experienced a nuclear crisis. There's all kinds of things which will be obvious, but only in retrospect. Not moving your missiles too close to the enemy's territory. Not giving launch authority too far down to the chain of command. Uh, we learn these things uh, through a series of small crises and other countries are going to have to learn them in the second nuclear age, and it's pretty dangerous. And you say the, the second nuclear age is, is already with us, and so it's not a matter at this point of trying to figure out how to head off a second nuclear age, but rather how to manage it. Does that extend to countries like Iran, sort of thinking that, uh, that trying to keep them from getting nuclear weapons at this point is sort of a foregone conclusion? Well, I think it's foregone in the sense I've never met anybody who hasn't believed that it's better to avoid a second nuclear age than to manage it, including myself. I believe that. But we're into the second nuclear age. As I said, you have nine nuclear weapon states. And you point out correctly that these are not hypothetical dangers. It's not hypothetical that Israel today is buying six diesel submarines from Germany and the purpose of this is pretty clearly to put their nuclear forces at sea because they imagine that Iran might get these weapons and could strike first and take out the small number of nuclear bases Israel has. So, and Pakistan is the fastest growing nuclear power in the world today. Pakistan has doubled its arsenal. This isn't some hypothetical possibility coming out of a war game. This is, this is a development that's happened over the last five years. And I could go on with India and with North Korea and China. And Russia recently staged its most realistic nuclear exercises in decades. So again, these are not hypothetical problems.
Now, you've also written about the issue of command and control, the issue of who, who has their finger on a trigger and, and how are weapons kept secure when not being uh, brought out and, and, and threatened in some way. Do you see the second nuclear age as being one in which command and control is an even bigger issue than it was in the first nuclear age? Command and control is a bigger issue uh, for several reasons. The most important one is that the size of these arsenals, how many weapons they have, is small compared to the Cold War. What does this mean? This, this means that the most attractive target is the brain of the enemy. That if you can paralyze the enemy by knocking out its command and control system, you only then have to destroy 50 to 100, maybe 150 nuclear targets, many of which are bunched together. This is an attack that is not that much bigger than what happened at Pearl Harbor in 1941. So the weak link is command and control. The problem, however, is that if the way to defend against such a thing is to delegate launch authority to more and more people, to spread it around and to spread out your nuclear weapons and make them more ready. For example, putting nuclear weapons on a jet on runway alert so it can take off instantly. I would look for Iran, for example, to embrace a launch on warning policy or to declare that they're doing that if they were to get nuclear weapons, that they would launch automatically if they saw missiles coming out of Israel or jets coming out of Israel. And as near as I can tell, nobody I have come across in Washington has thought very much about this. And, and what does it mean when you, when you have the delegation of a uh, nuclear weapon um, to, to, to people who might take decisions on their own that have catastrophic consequences? Well, clearly it makes an enormous difference. It's one thing to give launch authority to a general officer in the Air Force in the United States during the Cold War, but even that is something you don't want to do. Think about having it go to a Pakistani colonel or um, uh, even the, it, it, this is something Israel has to confront because it's such a tiny, compact country. Israel surely has delegated launch authority. We don't know exactly to whom. It's not hard to figure out. And in Iran, you have the Revolutionary Guards who might have a positive interest in provoking the situation. So we have much more split command and controls, the Iranian case, possibly in Pakistan. One thing we had in the Cold War in the US and the Soviet Union, we did have a unified command system. That's not guaranteed in the second nuclear age. And people talk a lot about if, if Iran gets a nuclear weapon, that that will provoke even further proliferation in the Middle East. And we've seen um, revolution in the Middle East just in the last year or two. And, and what are the prospects for uh, nuclear proliferation in the broader Middle East and, and how that may affect um, uh, strategy in the region? I would agree with most experts on this question who think that the chance of proliferation accelerating is quite high were Iran to test or get a nuclear weapon. And the suspects there would be uh, Saudi Arabia, which because of its tremendous wealth could simply buy some of these systems. They wouldn't have to go through the painstaking research and development. But also you have countries today which we don't think of as considering nuclear weapons, but if Iran gets the bomb, it will be a game changer because you will introduce major nuclear dynamics into the Middle East. So, so interviewing leaders today and them, them expressing no interest in the bomb, that's going to look very different. And here let me just single out Turkey and Algeria. Uh, Egypt is in a state of uh, a lot of chaos, uh, but down the road, yes, I could imagine Egypt wanting to embrace nuclear weapons as well. So it is really we have to do a lot harder thinking than we've done about nuclear weapons in recent years. So is the situation one where people will just learn to deal with a, a multi-polar nuclear wor world where there are lots of uh, nuclear players, or is there going to be some sort of catastrophe? Is that what it will take before there is a radical limitation on, and how would that happen? Yes, I don't know the answer to the question, but I think one of those two alternatives is likely. Uh, 
that these problems will be debated as hypothetical exaggeration pessimism, just the way Hurricane Katrina was before it hit New Orleans, or sex scandals in the Catholic Church, or the early stages of the AIDS disease. Uh, but I think there's a lot that can be done. We need new structures, new norms and rules. Let me just say, for example, the focus of U.S. government arms control policy is still on the strategic arms reduction talks with Russia, which basically have nothing to do with the problems that we're talking about here. It's as if we keep doing old-fashioned arms control because we know how to do it. But in my book, I go into a lot of new arms control proposals and new ways to think about arms control, new ways to establish conventions, which we can't ensure that North Korea or Iran will honor, but we can sure guarantee that they'll think about them if we make the consequences starkly. So I think there really is a lot more we can do with some uh, more creativity and thinking about nuclear weapons that goes beyond the narrow confines of uh, of non-proliferation theory. Well, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today. Paul Bracken of Yale University is author of The Second Nuclear Age, Strategy, Danger, and the New Power Politics. Thanks for joining us. Good to be here, thanks. And thank you for tuning in. I hope you'll join us again next week for On the Line. our phones to talk, text, videotape, take pictures and search the web, well how about getting your eyes checked as well? A new smartphone application could someday help you see more clearly that story next on Discoveries and Breakthroughs. Hi, F. Now you try it. Read the bottom line. Before you head to the eye doc, you may want to look into your app store. An eye test is just a click away. It personally would save my time and frustration going to a doctor office, as well as helps me to stay on top of my sight. LASIK eye patient Taya Leary is one of the first to use Netra. MIT experts in media arts and sciences developed an eye test you do yourself with a smartphone. Software downloaded to Netra displays parallel lines. The user has to make the lines overlap by using the up and down key. The user does this several times with the lens at different angles. The number of clicks it takes to make the lines overlap determines the prescription needed. The task that we ask the patient to do involves alignment of lines. Developers say Netra can determine near and far-sightedness as well as stigmatisms and the results could be emailed from the phone right to the doctor. You can see this being distributed to people where they can just reach thousands and thousands of people who will not otherwise have access to any kind of, of eye care. Taya has to get her vision checked every three to six months, but Netra could someday cut down on those visits and your trips to the doc's office as well. I'm Alex Kane reporting.